Hello, and welcome to Understanding CA-125 with Dr. Kevin Holcomb. My name is Savannah Shine. I'm the Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Uh, before the presentation begins, I just want to tell you a little bit about SHARE. We are a 39-year-old nonprofit organization. We help people through breast or ovarian cancer. We offer support of those who've been there. SHARE offers many services, including helplines, telephone and in-person support groups, and educational programs like this one. All services are free. For more information, please visit our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. Dr. Kevin Holcomb is a gynecologic oncologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital, while Cornell Medical College, and an associate professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Holcomb, whenever you're Thank ready. Thank you, Savannah. I appreciate it, and I want to thank you and Cher for the opportunity to uh, to uh, pass on. I hopefully will be some meaningful information. Um, I first gave this lecture at a NYU Survivors course. Uh, maybe some on the call were there, and this might be a repeat. But I, I think it's an important topic because CA125 is such an important test in the lives of women being cared for who have ovarian cancer. And I think the significance of it sometimes can be a bit un, uh, confusing. And so I wanted to really discuss the meaning of CA125 by going through the story of how the test was developed, because I think that answers a lot of the questions of its use. Review what are the potential uses of CA125, and then really look at what the evidence shows it can do. So I like to call this story, um, uh, as far as the development of CA125, of mice, men, and Miss McDonald, because uh, it, mice played a role, some men played a role, many patients, and especially this patient, Miss McDonald. Um, but the first man I'm going to mention in the story is Dr. Robert C. Knapp. And I start the story with him for a couple of reasons. Um, one, he was the former director of GYN and GYN Oncology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, I met Dr. Knapp uh, when I returned here to Cornell as he's a visiting scholar here. But most importantly, it was his lab at Harvard that invented CA-125. So he's a co-inventor of the test. And uh, Dr. Knapp has turned out to be probably the biggest mentor of my career. So I've, I've spoken to him at length about how this test was developed. So I'd, I'd like to share with you the story because I find it really interesting. And so the story begins in 1970, where Dr. Uh, Knapp arrives there, and he's interested in immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. And I know a lot of people are, it's a hot topic now how ovarian cancer can be treated with immunotherapy, but it's not a new concept. And all the way back in the 1970s, Dr. Knapp thought that the body should be able to recognize this as foreign and fight against it. And in order to test a lot of his uh, theories, um, he developed this uh, ovarian cancer model in a mouse model. It was called the C3HED mouse. And uh, Dr. Knapp talks about this mouse very, very commonly and, he, and very affectionately, actually. He says that this mouse is what got him tenure at Cornell because it was through that mouse model that he answered a lot of the questions of what causes the development of ascites and, um, and tested a number of immunotherapies, but with variable success in this model. Um, like any good team, it takes a, a critical mass before you start seeing real results, and things started moving along when Dr. Bast joined Dr. Knapp's lab. Now, anybody in the medical field, especially in cancer research, would know Robert Bast because he's the chair for cancer research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. But back in 1977, he was finishing up his fellowship in medical oncology at the Sydney Farber Cancer Institute. And he graduated and he joined Dr. Knapp's lab. And uh, although he had no prior experience in ovarian cancer, he was also interested in immunotherapy and had also uh, done a fellowship at the NIH looking at the role of immunotherapy in leukemia. So he was well fit for uh, Dr. Knapp's lab, but no prior ovarian cancer experience. The two of them were um, trying to develop immunotherapies, but one of the things you need for immunotherapy and the way they were trying to deliver it is the magic bullet. That, uh, that, that way of delivering a treatment to a cancer cell that will only go to that cell and no place else. And to do that, you need what's called a monoclonal antibody. You need an antibody that identifies a tumor-specific antigen and, and nothing else. And it hadn't really been developed before. The German cell biologist, George 
Kohler and the Argentinian biochemist Cesar Milstein invented a technology at Cambridge that came to be known as a hybridoma. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize in 1984 for this work, and a hybridoma is just mixing together two types of cells. One is a B lymphocyte, which is the type of immune cell that produces antibodies, and the other is a myeloma cell, which is a bone marrow malignancy cell. And because every B lymphocyte only produces one single antibody, when you immortalize that cell by fusing it with a cancer cell, you produce a specific monoclonal antibody in perpetuity. So Drs. Knapp and Bass both traveled to Cambridge at some point to study with Dr. Milstein and learned how to produce uh, monoclonal antibodies. And they brought this technology back to Harvard. And the way they had it set up is Dr. Knapp is doing most of the surgeries, or all the surgeries, actually. He's bringing back uh, clinical tumor samples, either ascites or um, uh, specimens from debulking surgeries to the lab. <clears throat> and Dr. Bast is trying to develop a monoclonal antibody using this hybridoma technology. Um, and they really tried a lot. Um, they tried 100 24 times without success before Ms. McDonald's tumor was, uh, uh, which had led to the ovarian cancer cell line OVCA433, when they used that specific cell, they were actually able to develop a monoclonal antibody to this glycoprotein that sits on the surface of ovarian cancer cells. They called that monoclonal antibody OC125, and it was specifically because this was the 125th attempt at doing this, and it was the first time it was successful. And uh, again, the CA125 antigen is a glycoprotein on the surface of the cancer cell. No one knows exactly what its, its function is. Um, so when you think of the CA125 test, you have to remember there were 124 patients whose uh, samples had been tried before this unsuccessfully. So I, I think it speaks towards the stick to of, of many basic scientists. Um, after developing this monoclonal antibody, they began publishing on it. Um, the first publication on OC125 is in 1981, and what they did was they wanted to see was it specific for ovarian cancer. So they put this monoclonal antibody um, in, in, in culture with six ovarian cancer cell lines and 20 clinical ovarian cancer specimens. And what was encouraging is that it reacted with all six of the ovarian cancer cell lines and 12 of the 20 clinical ovarian cancer specimens, but it was specific for cancer, at least they thought at that point. There were no adult or fetal normal ovarian specimens that reacted, and only one out of 14 non-ovarian cancer cell lines reacted to OC125, which suggested that it was very, very specific for ovarian cancer. The reason why we have a blood test for CA125 now comes from their involvement with uh, 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 Dr. Zarowski, who worked for Centacor, which was a, um, a company that produced uh, lab tests. And they wanted to develop what's called a radioimmunoassay from, CA120, from the uh, OC125 antibody. And the way it works is that you have, you have to have this first antibody that can bind the antigen in, in, in question, in this case, CA125. I'm sorry, my phone is going to keep ringing for you. Um, you add unlabeled antigen, meaning the person's blood, and that will displace the, uh, the radioactive antigen that was attached. And the amount of radioactive antigen that you detached is the same as how much was in the blood in the first place, and you can measure that. And then, so you could measure the amount of this monoclonal antibody in someone's blood. And that developed the CA125 blood test. Now, what's interesting is that this antibody that came from Ms. McDonald's tumor is the same monoclonal antibody that's used in every CA125 test worldwide. So once they had the blood test, they started trying to figure out what is the normal range of CA125 in women's blood. In 1983, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they had a serum bank of 188 healthy adult women and ran the CA125 blood test, the radioimmunoassay, and all of them. And what they found is only one out of 888 healthy adult women had a CA125 greater than 35, and that's what established 35 as the cutoff of normal. But when they looked at women who had ovarian cancer, 82% of them had CA125 greater than 5 units per mil. 
probably the most important thing that came out of this early study was that when they looked at women who were in the middle of their treatment for ovarian cancer, whether in surgery or post-op chemotherapy, that rising levels of CA125 correlated with disease progression and falling levels of CA125 correlated with regression in 93% of patients. Now, what really amazed me is that this was done before there were CAT scans. And so their assessment of whether someone was progressing or, or responding was largely just the gestalt of the doctor looking at the patient and making a general assessment of their clinical outcome. And yet the ability of CA125 to, um, to mirror response to chemotherapy has been um, proven in the days of CAT scans and PET scans. It's always uh, held up that it can do this. And to this date, it is the only FDA approval for CA125 for the monitoring of someone during chemotherapy. But you can see all the potential uses that it may be able to do. Um, yeah, you can monitor the response to ovarian cancer, but if you could do that, potentially you could screen asymptomatic women for the early detection of ovarian cancer. And, and as you probably know, early stage ovarian cancer has quite a good survival rate. And if we could cause a migration to earlier stages with a good screen, undoubtedly many lives would be saved. Um, surveillance of women with a history of ovarian cancer uh, for the early detection of recurrence is another possible role for this test. And also the, all the women who present with an adnexal mass, an ovarian mass, and we're not sure whether it's cancer or not, maybe CA125 could help us in the preoperative risk assessment and determining which masses were more likely to be cancer. So all these potential uses are there, but let's see what the evidence shows. Well. <clears throat> I already mentioned that monitoring response to ovarian cancer treatment is well established, established to the point where CA125 is used as a measurement of response in almost every phase two trial of chemotherapy and ovarian cancer. A response in chemotherapy of CA125 is at least a 50% reduction in CA125 levels from a pretreatment sample. So maybe some of you or you know someone has had the experience of <coughs> starting a new chemotherapy regimen and having the CA125 drop slightly and being told that they have stable disease when they see the number going down. And that's because response starts at a 50% reduction. And a progression tumor going growing is at least a doubling of CA125 from the upper limit of normal, or if you had never normalized your CA125 from the lowest possible value, the nadir value. And when you diagnose somebody with that, it's doubling, and staying that high, then the chances of that being from something other than tumor progression is less than 2%. So again, monitoring well, well established and well supported that you can monitor ovarian cancer response. What about screening asymptomatic women for early detection? I think this has been the holy grail that we all hope CA125 would be able to do, but it's really limited by a few things. And the first uh, is its low sensitivity. Um, I mentioned earlier that 82% of women with ovarian cancer have an elevated CA125, but unfortunately the majority of women who present do so at stage 3 and 4. And so for a screen to be effective, you need to have a really good pickup in stage 1. And CA125 doesn't offer that. About 50% of patients with stage 1 ovarian cancer have a normal CA125. It's only elevated in about 50%. It's, the biggest issue, though, is really its, its limitations of low specificity. Although Dr. Knapp's early study suggested that it would only react with ovarian cancer specimens, it turns out CA125 levels are elevated in women with a number of benign GYN issues, like uterine fibroids, endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and numerous non-gynecologic pathologies, <coughs> including cancers from other sites. So it's limited on both the sensitivity and the specificity end. There have been a number of trials um, screening asymptomatic women for the early detection of ovarian cancer. Um, the largest American trial was done by the NCI, um, the PLCO trial. It was not just looking at ovarian cancer, but also the roles of, of screening for prostate, lung, and colon cancer as well. But for the ovarian cancer screening arm, there were about 78,000 women enrolled and 39,000 randomly assigned to receive annual transvaginal sonograms for four years and serum CA125 blood tests for six years. Um, 
but in the end, when they compared the women, um, sorry, when they compared the survival of women who were being screened and those who were not being screened, there was no difference in ovarian cancer mortality. Um, the United Kingdom uh, ovarian cancer screening trial just reported their findings recently, which are which use CA125 slightly differently. They didn't look at a, a number cutoff like 35 to be considered abnormal. Instead, they use an algorithm that of the change in CA125 level from year to year to trigger a sonogram. That's called the risk of uh, ovarian cancer algorithm, and uh, Although the uh, results were recently produced, it appears that there's minimal impact on, on uh, mortality even in that way of screening. And so CA125 has not proven to be the um, effective screen that we had hoped. And uh, at this point in 2016, I'd have to say there still is no effective screen for ovarian cancer that has been proven to decrease mortality from the disease. Um, So one of the other things you could do with CA125 is to do surveillance of women in remission for recurrence. So meaning someone who had advanced ovarian cancer had an elevated CA125 at her presentation, but now has completed surgery, completed chemotherapy, and it has a normal CA125, normal physical exam, and normal CAT scan. And this doctor here, who's the next man in the uh, story, Gordon Rustin, um, he did a large study showing that CA125 in the in patients who are in remission, if the CA125 progresses, that that is likely tumor recurrence. And what they found was that if the CA125 doubled the upper limit of normal of that lab and stayed that way for a month, there was only about a 6% chance that that doubling was not due to cancer. So it appeared that CA125 could predict recurrence better than CAT scans. In fact, it was it was shown in these studies that clinical recurrence lagged CA125 recurrence on average of four to five months. But the big question became, um, does that early diagnosis of recurrence translate into a survival advantage? Uh, we had assumed for years that just finding out earlier must lead to some sort of better outcome. But Dr. Rustin did a randomized controlled trial where um, 529 women who were in remission were randomly assigned to early versus delayed treatment of recurrent ovarian cancer. So all of these women were getting CA125 blood tests, but they were blinded, and so were their, their um, caregivers. Um, but women in the early treatment group were notified if their CA125 elevated greater than two times the upper limit of normal. And they had to, by protocol, start treatment within 28 days of that elevation. Whereas the women in the late treatment group continued to have the CA125 masked until they showed some clinical evidence of remission. And what uh, Dr. Rustin showed was that when it came to overall survival, those women with the early detection of recurrence and the women with the delayed detection of recurrence did almost exactly the same as far as survival. And when, it, when you look at how long it takes to institute the second line of chemotherapy, CA125 proved better than clinical exam to picking up recurrence. Women on the early arm started uh, chemotherapy about five months earlier than um, women on the delayed arm. But when you looked how long it took time the women to get onto a third line of treatment, the women on the early arm were on the third chemotherapy faster than the women who were on the delayed arm. And when you look at the first deterioration in the global health score, the women on the early arm reached the first deterioration faster because they started chemotherapy faster. So Dr. Rustin's study suggested that, yes, uh, CA125 can pick up recurrence um, earlier than clinical symptoms to the tune of about five months, which is consistent with the prior data, but that it did not translate into an overall survival benefit and had some negative impact when it came to global health uh, scores and quality of life. So um, there's some questionable benefit of why we do CA125 surveillance. There have been some studies that have looked at the ability to do debulking, 
cytoreductive reductive surgery in, in the recurrent setting and say that patients who have CA125 surveillance have a better chance of being optimally debulked in the recurrent setting. Um, what remains to be seen is if that is a benefit in, with regard to overall survival. As far as the role of CA125 in the preoperative evaluation of a woman with a suspicious mass, and um, this is something that Dr. Knapp and his group tried way back in 1988, one of the first studies on this with Dr. Marcasian being the first author. They looked at 158 women who had pelvic masses who were scheduled for surgery. 90 of them ended up being benign and 68 had malignancy on the final pathology. And at the time they were using a CA125 cutoff of 65. And they found that CA125 greater than 65 is only present in 8% of benign, but in 75% of the women with malignant masses, suggesting that it could help to differentiate the two. CA125 had a 91% sensitivity for the detection of epithelial ovarian cancer. Um, the positive predictive value, which means what's the likelihood that you have the disease if the test says you do? The positive predictive value for postmenopausal women was 98% because they are less likely to have things like PID and fibroids and endometriosis. But it was only 49% in premenopausal women. So there's some real limitations of CA125 in the evaluation of a woman with a pelvic mass, particularly in premenopausal women. Um, as I mentioned before, there's so many other causes of an elevated CA125. Um, fibroids, endometriosis, PID, pregnancy can elevate your CA125. Uh, hemorrhagic cysts, liver disease or congestion, diverticulitis, and then uh, the malignant causes that are non-GYN are listed on the right side. And you can see there's a number of non-gynecologic cancers that can elevate your CA125 in addition to some of the other GYN cancers as well. So this is a big issue because we have millions of women uh, presenting with adnexal masses per year and decisions have to be made of who should be doing the surgery. As you probably know, there's a wealth of data now showing that women who are operated on by GYN oncologists uh, have a better survival than those who are handled by general OBGYNs or by general surgeons. And so sometimes that first step of where this woman goes for surgery can be uh, a very important step. And so since CA125 alone doesn't appear to perform very well in distinguishing, especially in premenopausal women, who has cancer and who doesn't, the FDA approved recently um, two tests that I just want to review with you. Um, the first is OVO1. And this is FDA approved for women over 18 years of age who already have a detected ovarian mass and the decision has already been made they're going for surgery. Um, this test is not used to determine who needs surgery. This is a test that's been FDA approved to help decide who should do the surgery. So once a woman already has a plan for surgery, they send this test and there's a qualitative uh, measurement of five biomarkers into a single score and the members of the test are listed below. And you'll notice the fifth one is CA125. So the backbone of this test is still CA125. And uh, the, the other four values are put together into a single risk score. And it performed very, very well in its registration uh, trials. Um, the first being a trial of 590 women with adnexal masses going to the OR. And they found that um, the sensitivity for cancer for OV1, OV1 was 93% but the specificity was low, 43%. And the positive predictive value was fairly low at 42%. So if the test said you had cancer, you still probably didn't have cancer, but that's high enough to say you should go to a G1 oncologist and it outperformed clinical assessment alone. Um, there was a good um, reassurance if the test said you don't have cancer, it was a 92% negative predictive value. But it improved physician assessment for the detection of cancer, not just for um, primary OBGYNs, but for G1 oncologists as well. And the second test is something called ROMA. And ROMA is another uh, test that takes into account CA125 with a second marker, what's called human epididymis 4, or HE4, and your menopausal status. Um, Roma uh, uh, came about because uh, 
the group at Brown was looking to see which tumor markers could pick up cancer in an adnexal mass the best. And, and that came to the conclusion that HE4 and CA125 were the best uh, combination of tests. And they looked at a, about another five uh, uh, markers to see if they added to this. But um, the ROMA, which takes into account HE4 and CA125, it had a 92% sensitivity, but the specificity, the chances that if the tumor, if it's saying it's positive that you have that, that tumor um, was 7%. It was much less likely confused by non-cancerous things. And that specificity held up even premenopausal women. So Roma, and specifically because HE4, uh, it, it holds up against uh, things like endometriosis. It's a better distinguisher of cancer there. So HE4 and uh, CA125 is Roma and OVA1 are two tests that the FDA now offer if someone presents with an adnexal mass to help with that triage process. So um, when you look at the, the impact of CA125, I don't mean to belittle its impact in our field because being able to monitor the response to ovarian cancer during treatment is obviously a huge um, ability to know when we're in the, going in the right direction or when we're going in the wrong direction. But that use is the one thing that CA125 does well and it's the one thing that is FDA approval, approved for. Screening of asymptomatic women for early detection of ovarian cancer has been tried repeatedly, and yet we've seen no significant impact on, on overall mortality from the cancer from screening. We've shown that you can use CA125 for the early detection of recurrence, but we haven't been able to prove that there is an impact on survival by knowing sooner. And when it comes to the preoperative evaluation of women presenting with an adnexal mass, CA125 alone doesn't seem to be able to distinguish cancer from uh, benign masses sufficiently, but can be added to some other markers and, and do better. Um, so when uh, Dr. Knapp was featured in what they call the Distinguished Professor Series um, uh, soon after his retirement and his reflections on ovarian cancer, um, he starts off his statement by saying, 33 years ago, I believe that it was possible to develop effective therapeutic regimens to cure ovarian cancer. In fact, I thought that since this cancer was foreign to the host, it would be possible to stimulate the body's defenses against the malignancy. Now I wonder how much the body recognizes the cancer as foreign. Then I was young, eager, and naive. Now I'm left with the legacy of a brash endeavor. Um, so I think Dr. Knapp was looking for something else. He was looking for a way to deliver immunotherapy, but what he gave us was a very, very important test for monitoring patients with ovarian cancer. and. Uh, and I think we're, the, the field is much better and the patients are much better off because of this test. So that is the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, thank you so much um, for that presentation, Dr. Holcomb. The first question I have here is how often is it recommended to get tested for CA125? Well. I think uh, it's, it, there's no general recommendation, but there is a pretty common practice, and it's based on the times where the risk of recurrence is the highest. So, uh, and I'm assuming the person is asking who's had ovarian cancer may be in remission. And for that patient, um, we're checking every three months in general in the first two years because that's the highest risk of recurrence. Most uh, recurrence happen within that time period and then spreading out to semi-annually um, from years three to five. And some will still do a semi-annual thereafter, but I think it's also safe to go to once a year if there's been no recurrence in five years. That's common practice. It's not necessarily based on any science per se. Um, for outside of that clinical situation, there really is no indication for, um, oh, I should, uh, there's no indication for screening. For patients who are getting the chemotherapy and getting monitored with CA125, typically we check a CA125 with every cycle of chemo. Um, what's the next step of the results? I think you sort of already covered this, but um, in case you had anything to add about the next step, if the results are above or below the normal range. Well, it, it's only a, a concern if it's elevated. Um, usually it depends the the setting. If someone is getting a CA125 in, uh, in remission, a patient who's in remission, and their CA125 is elevated, 
um, typically it's followed by some sort of imaging. Um, unless a physical examination is, is instructive and tells you that there's recurrence. But normally it's going to trigger a CAT scan. And then if there are findings on the CAT scan, that would may indicate uh, an indication for retreatment at that point. And in some cases it may be more appropriate just to have expectant management and not treat at that point, but defer treatment to later. Okay. Um, what do you conclude if, while on chemotherapy, the CA125 rises, yet scans show a stable disease or no growth of existing tumors? <clears throat> when there is a discrepancy between CA125 and uh, imaging, I, I, I defer to imaging. If someone has, a, because of CA125, um, its lack of specificity, you can't say 100% why the CA125 is rising. And if the CAT scan is showing no new sites of disease and, and stability in the known sites of disease, I would call that patient stable. Okay. Um, what about CA125's um, indication for clear cell? When you say indication, is it useful well, for clear cell carcinoma? Yeah, I guess is it more or less accurate as an indicator for clear cell is the question. Well, you know, the thing about clear cell is that the majority of clear cell carcinoma is actually early stage cancer, and CA125 is just likely less likely to be elevated in early stage disease. So I would say overall, you're probably less likely to see an elevation um, in CA125 in clear cell carcinoma, but that's probably more related to the stage of disease than anything else. Um, if your CA125 is elevated pre-treatment, it's a useful marker no matter what the cell type. But chances are you're more likely to be elevated with a serous carcinoma than a clear cell. Okay. Um, why are there times when the CA125 is low and a patient is, po well, this is, the question is positive for ovarian cancer, but I guess. Well, not, like said, it's, it, it has to do with the fact that um, not every cancer produces CA125. And one of the things that Dr. Knapp's group saw very, very early when they first developed this monoclonal antibody and were seeing what, it, what would it stick to, um, you saw that it, it, it reacted with all six over established ovarian cancer cell lines. But when they brought specimens in from the OR, it reacted with 12 out of 20. So that means there were eight of those 20 that it did not react to. My guess is those were mucinous adenocarcinomas, maybe a clear cell, maybe uh, a tumor that just does not express CA125. So it's only a useful marker for you if it was elevated at the time of the patient's presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this person has a question about whether ovarian cancer is a marker for any kind of metastatic breast cancer. If CA125 is a, mm -hmm. is a marker for metastatic breast cancer? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it can be. Um, it, and if you looked at the uh, the slide where I show all the reasons why CA125 lacks specificity, mm -hmm. one of those cancers that can elevate CA125 is breast cancer, okay. um, along with colon and uh, lung cancer. It, a number of cancers can produce CA125, and so an elevation. In fact, I I typically. I, I look for histologic confirmation for every first recurrence, meaning that I would like to have a piece of tissue showing me that this is recurrent ovarian cancer for that first recurrence, just for that reason, because other tumors may uh, develop that may elevate your CA125 as well. Okay. Um, so this question is, after, after an ovarian cancer diagnosis, recurrence, surgery, and chemotherapy, um, and CA125 is then normal, but we're always told not to rely on this as a definitive marker. Why is this so? The reason being is because it, we, I spend a fair amount of the time talking about how nonspecific CA125 is, but the other part of its weakness is its lack of sensitivity, meaning that in very small volume disease, your CA125 can be normal and you still have cancer. That's why it's only elevated in 50% of stage one tumors. And in the past, it was a common practice to do what's called a second look laparotomy. So after completing chemotherapy and surgery, when the woman was in uh, complete uh, clinical remission, they would do another surgery. They would open the patient up and do multiple um, biopsies to try to establish 
who was truly in remission. Um, and what we found 50% of the time when you were in a clinical remission, if you went back and did surgery, you would be able to detect um, residual disease in 50% of those patients. So we know that uh, CA125 is somewhat limited to truly define a complete response. Okay. Um, there's a question about um, immune therapy response, and can it, if I guess I'm guessing this person might be in an immunotherapy trial, can immune th therapy response cause a flare-up of CA125 as it is having an effect on the tumors? You know, I have to tell you, I don't know. Um, I could think of why that might happen. Uh, yeah, I, I could think of lots of reasons why you might see a flare there. But I'm not, I'm not sure, to be honest, specifically for immune uh, therapy. But we know from uh, just standard therapies that are approved for ovarian cancer that you can see elevations in CA125 before you see responses. Um, for example, doxyl, and, which is used commonly in, in the recurrent setting, is known for this, uh, that we, we tend not to pay much attention to the CA125s in the first three, sometimes even four cycles of doxyl therapy because we see it going up, but it will ultimately uh, drop back down. Now, we consider that um, just time to uh, the, the chemo to have an effect. We don't necessarily think of this as a flare. We think of it as tumor progression before the, the medication actually works, but I, I guess there's some chance that could just be a flare caused by the medication. Okay. Um, a question about uh, whether the disease is more serious, the higher the CA-125. For everything over 35 is, is abnormal, but some patients have levels in the hundreds and others have levels in the thousands. Yeah, that is a, it's a really good question, but there's no one answer to that because if you're talking about a tumor that, um, that uh, produces CA-125, like a serous carcinoma, which is your typical cell type, the level of the CA125 typically can correlate with the volume of disease. So yes, there's a number of trials showing that a very elevated CA125, for example, is a marker for a suboptimal debulking, or that a high level of CA125 at the time of recurrence is a marker for a decreased chance of response. So in some situations, it, it, it correlates with volume of disease. But then there's always the chance that you have a low level of CA125 because you have a cell type that just doesn't produce much CA125. So you can actually have a fair volume of disease and yet have a low value. So I don't think that you can make a blanket statement across the board. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of screening questions of naturally. Um, one is a sort of uh, the, in the in the realm I'm imagining of genetic. Uh, mutation question about daughters and you know daughters of mothers who've had ovarian cancer but they've never been diagnosed. You know, is sure. it is it um, follow if is a CA125 and transvaginal ultrasound the recommended sort of screening protocol for those women? Yeah, this is one of those strange uh, things when you break it down because uh, the answer is yes for people who are either not ready for prophylactic surgery, they're below the age where we recommend it because we, we at this point we're still pretty much lumping BRCA1 and 2 together and largely the risk-benefit ratio seems to favor prophylactic surgery at 40 uh, years of age, but uh, uh, this is assuming that you don't have uh, earlier onsets of ovarian cancer in your family. But what do you do for somebody who's still having kids or just uh, maybe not ready even if they're after 40 for a prophylactic surgery, we do recommend ovarian cancer screening, but you really have to explain to that patient that there isn't any proof that that screening is effective in decreasing mortality. And I think it's important to make that point because otherwise someone may get the impression that, uh, as it is with breast cancer, where there are there is a screen that's been proven to save lives with MRIs and mammograms, but that's not the case with ovarian cancer. But it is our recommended treatment largely because we don't have anything else to offer for screening before that. Got it. So the most effective thing you could do for someone with a, uh, a, a scary family history of cancer is have them genetically tested and, and really define their risk. Screening, I don't think, is the answer. Okay. 
Um, a question about um, a CA27.29 marker. Um, is that uh, my doctor uses it, that marker for my treatment? Is that standard? It's 2729 is is usually a breast cancer marker, um, not an ovarian cancer marker. But if if for some reason your tumor was a low expressor of CA125 or uh, just through a sort of shotgun uh, uh, tumor marker panel, it was shown that CA2729 was more elevated than CA125. It may be the case that uh, 2729 is what they're using because it's the one thing that's showing up. But the definitions of progression and response and recurrence and all those things that have been worked out so closely with CA125, I don't think it would be fair to necessarily extend those same definitions to 2729. Um, for example, with CA125, we know if it doubles the upper limit of normal in the recurrent setting, um, that you can be pretty sure that that's due to recurrence. I'm not sure how you'd uh, evaluate an elevating 2729. Um, but I have seen cases that of tumors that don't express CA125 but do express some other marker, and we end up following that. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Holcomb, for your time. It was my pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad we were joined by some people, and I hope it's, uh, the information proves helpful for them. It really will. It really will. Thank you so much.